So Hannah is a research associate. Uh, Hannah Svatos Rajnevich, is it right? Almost okay. And uh, she is a doctoral candidate um, at the Institute for Computational Design and Construction, short ICD, also at the University of Stuttgart. She holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornwall University, as well as a Master in Science in Architecture from Integrative Technology and um, Architecture and Design Research Program. So that's a uh, very famous program here at the Stuttgart University, in short, uh, ITEC. And uh, prior to joining ICD, Hanna worked as an architect in Oslo, Norway, and as a designer in Chiavari and Milano, Italy, as well as a multiple architectural office in Croatia, New York, and Ithaca, New York, also New York. And uh, from 1915 till 1916, she was a teaching associate for first year design studio in Cornwall University's Department of Architecture. And one more currently, Hannah is a member of the class of excellence, like Hannah, um, the NCDC. And she is uh, focusing on the co design and novel building to, uh, typologies, typologies, I'm sorry, within multi story timber buildings. And uh, I'm surprised what she wants to show us now. So, Anna, now the stage is yours. Thank you, Moritz. Uh, let me just start. Okay, so I hope you can um, see the screen. In case there's any internet interruptions, um, like I will apologize, it's been a bit unstable, but I hope um, everything goes um, without any interruptions throughout um, this event. Um, so today I'll give a um, kind of overview presentation that um, serves as a basis of the research I'm conducting at ICD as part of the Cluster of Excellence on typological possibilities and limitations in multi-story timber construction. Um, so as Alia already explained, we both work on a project together, um, but the research question I'm dealing with is what new architectural typologies and morphologies can be enabled by computational co-design methods, and what exactly are the design requirements to create a novel multi-story timber typology. So, as we all know, there are some um, global challenges that we're facing all together today. Um, decarbonization, as well as urbanization and densification of cities. Um, some of the um, reports and research therefore already claims that building area in Europe and US alone is to double in the next 50 years alone. Therefore, we need more buildings to house all of these people. However, at the same time, there's been stagnation in the building industry since the 90s. So there's a productivity gap in construction, which relates at the same time to a low degree of digitization. So that means that there's a lack of innovation in a way in construction and that new methods are necessary. At the same time, what we see happening is that there's still separation of design and construction and that the full potential of digital technology is underutilized today. So what comes as um, a, a response to both of these um, kind of challenges is timber, mostly because um, it has a lot of good benefits, such as being carbon storage, being lightweight, um, and so on, but also really uh, ties in well with digitization. So digital wood might be a good way forward in terms of prefabrication, noise reduction, and housing all of these people in a more sustainable way. So what's happening right now is that multi-story timber buildings are on the rise. This diagram shows that there has been an increase in number of projects. At the same time, if you're able to read this uh, um, diagram where the color change correlates to the height, you can see that also the lighter it gets, the higher the projects get. So speed and height have kind of been the main focus in timber construction 
as a goal. So what's really important in um, my research is actually establishing a good basis of what is currently possible in timber construction in terms of architectural design and how this is linked to structural systems available today in timber. So that leads to kind of a study of morphologies of today. And I'm just going to show a few precursors. So early 20th century in 1905, this is already a multi-story building that's kind of contained. Um, it's called Butler Square in Minnesota in USA. You can kind of see it's a timber frame. At the same time, there's um, a bit later uh, pioneering projects at uh, the uh, beginning of 1990s. And steadily as we go into 2000s, uh, timber is really um, already um, at a level that that three and four story timber construction is possible. Um, so what's um, have been happening in Sweden is there were two waves of uh, timber um, building incentives. So the wave one kind of had this um, period until uh, 2000 and then in wave um, two post 2000s. And we can kind of already see here that um, Kind of serial and prefabricated ideas are present. So, as part of uh, my research, um, I've conducted an initial study that um, overviewed multi story timber projects of 2000 and onwards. This ended up in a list of a uh, total of, I think, right now, 350 projects, even where almost 3000 are built. Um, eight in construction and uh, oh, sorry, 300 are built, eight in construction and almost 40 proposals. Um, the um, kind of scope was that um, the projects had to be over three stories tall and it was worldwide survey. The sources were quite numerous. It was from books, magazines, um, global reports, uh, papers, from literature studying multi-story timber, but also a growing number of websites that report on the developments in timber construction, um, such as Triple Wood, Data Holds, but also specific um, kind of uh, detailed publications that would focus on wood, as well as some sort of gray literature, such as um, um, master thesis projects uh, or bachelor projects. You can kind of get an overview of how these sources also impacted where the projects are located. So, of course, if there's a lot of um, German or UK sources, then the projects were mostly there, which might explain the absence of um, developments in some countries. You can kind of see that Central Europe and Scandinavia are quite um, focused, as well as US and Australia. And um, the study began with by kind of grouping and thinking about the projects already relating to the structural system and trying to see what is each system really enabling um, designers or how it's um, limiting and um, being shown in terms of massing and plan. So they were grouped kind of, um, as you can see in the uh, pictures in the three main groups, thinking about um, one dimensional timber elements, two-dimensional um, timber elements uh, panels and three-dimensional um, space module construction. So these kind of groups can then be thought of as sort of frame and skeleton ideas, which are usually composed of post and beam structures, very rarely post and slab, and mostly in unbuilt projects as well right now and proposals. Um, Panel systems, which consist of cross wall or uh, honeycomb uh, type structures, um, where these wall planes, two dimensional elements are the main vertical divisions. Um, and finally, um, the space modules, where the module arrangement really guides the whole design. So, as part of looking at these um, 300 or 350 projects, there were several architectural criteria that was looked at. So part of that was, of course, what was the massing like? Um, what was the interior 
like as well. So what was um, the solid void relationship on the inside? What was the permanent spatial layout? Um, the position of the pore and circulation spaces, as well as the ordering system, or what actually guided the division of space and um, its connection. An additional part was also looking at kind of material composition. Uh, so was there concrete, a significant amount of concrete in certain areas of the design? So in this uh, Fukuoka modular housing example, you can kind of see uh, a plinth in concrete, a very short one, almost more like a basement level, but other considerations such as whether a core was made out of concrete or certain areas of the slab were related. And all of these things were kind of looked at um, together and compared to see how material structural system affected um, the design. So we um, managed to build this comparative database of the projects collecting their plans and sections. Um, a big thanks to all of the heavies that worked really hard on organizing this with me and gathering data and drawing some of the plans. So some of the kind of results you can already see here uh, for yourself. This is a small selection of the projects. So you can kind of see them organized into a group of frame, panel, module, as well as some combinations of systems. So in terms of massing, um, what's kind of visible is that the forms are mostly um, rectangular based and orthogonal, but there is still quite a variation um, in some of the projects. Okay. Oops, sorry, a glitch. <laughs> in terms of program, um, if you kind of look at this kind of pinkish hue that kind of signifies housing, you can also see that the predominant um, program of um, timber buildings is housing mostly um, apartments, uh, student housing, affordable housing, retirement homes, uh, but also hotels, hostels. Um, and this shows up in all three of the structural systems. However, the frame um, is most suitable to office uh, programs. And what's also noticeable that educational programs uh, also happen in module construction on some sort of module plus frame construction in order to be able to offer a wider range of um, spaces such as a large hall for exercise as well as classrooms. This kind of um, formal analysis also might correlate to kind of um, the status of the project, whether it's more social or affordable or high end greatly influence the form and the design of the projects as well. However, when we look at the ordering systems uh, themselves, or these kind of blue lines marked on the permanent structural elements, we can see that even some of the more irregular projects are in fact based on um, grids and repetitive um, sequence of spaces. So we can kind of see a small selection of how the massing complexity evolves in current multi-story timber construction. You can see that modular um, construction does seem to offer a greater variety of uh, volumetric forms, which might happen through staggering or changes of orientations, um, but also uh, frame construction starting to deviate the grid um, and finally, at the very top, some sort of panel systems showing more non-orthogonal designs. What's happening in height is basically that the stories kind of repeat and stack on top of each other with very little variation from floor to floor. So when we actually look at the data um, and kind of compare what's happening in form, we can see that these rectangular super um, orthogonal symmetrical masses account even 76.3% um, of the current multi-story buildings. While these kind of um, still rectangle-based and semi-orthogonal places make almost 20%. While this kind of more custom um, area 
types of projects, they account only for 4%. And this is just in terms of massing. And when we look at the ordering system, um, well, I think this percentage is obviously wrong, sorry, <laughs> but we can see that the um, irregular project or something non-grid-based or even non-linear um, um, grid-based accounts for only 1.1% of projects, so out of 350 in multi-story timber. So if we get to see an overview, we can see that this strict repetition is happening both in panel and module projects. It's also happening in frame, uh, regardless of some um, deviations in terms of massing. And we can see somehow that um, although that there are variations in modules um, where size may vary, modules may be combined to create larger spaces, um, they seem to create the same typology linearly arranged spaces. Uh, and then, of course, that these kind of more open central areas, which might not even be multi story timber, are actually what adds a greater diversity in terms of design, as you can see, for example, in Hotel um, Jakarta or in Mofold, where the core and the empty uh, space kind of frame the basis of common space. In terms of um, extrusions, we can see that um, height variation kind of adds a bit of dynamics in the design or the variation of balconies, or for example, proposed projects which are unbuilt or might not even be built start to experiment with this, but they do not use really the most typical um, systems in mass timber construction. There are some instances where floor plates slightly variate. It's very small and minute, such as this inverse ziggurat nodi in um, Gothenburg, Sweden, or Orsman Road, but Orsman Road, for example, has also steel construction inside, uh, so beams and columns on top of which is a CLT slab, um, and patch 22, where there is this kind of loja um, zigzag happening. And then when we move into the more rare of the projects, you can see that small grid splits are happening, such as Project Harbor 12, but very minutely, an area of the grid just kind of does a shift and detaches smallly. Um, or Wenlock Cross, where um, orthogonal segments of rooms are kind of rotated around a core to create variation. And then, of course, Mazarin House, which is a very small multi family house project built in panels, kind of shows us together that uh, panel projects at sort of a small scale seem to offer more design freedom in terms of form. Uh, than currently uh, frame projects are offering. So when we look at the scale of these studies and think about the data, so these regular rectangular projects that make up the majority are also much larger, and these irregular projects seem to be much, much smaller and more rare, which says something about the way that we're building today. So in order to see what actually happens in terms of timber performance, and material usage um, and why things are the way they are. We also started drawing a smaller number of projects, looking at their spanning direction and main structural elements. So these are two examples, um, Rock Commons and Tamedia that will be talked about in a bit. But the main conclusion was that most spans in current timber construction are unidirectional even though CLT offer does offer bidirectional properties in a lot of the cases due to the locations of the supports, it doesn't really utilize that. And a lot of the projects that especially use beams definitely um, reiterate this unidirectionality, but also somehow limit the flexibility of space um, because with beams, it's harder to make um, adjustments later in the design in terms of partition wall location. What you can maybe also notice is that the spans in some of the projects in timber are quite, quite small. So these cross wall or panel projects um, means that there's a lot of load bearing walls and a lot of density. 
So throughout this study, we tried to kind of identify exceptional cases and um, what was actually the area where there was some instance of a non-standardized approach or something more irregular and how it was dealt with. So an example would be the juxtaposition between those, these two projects, um, where one is very, very orthogonal and the other one is uh, more non-orthogonal, but still um, is based on this idea of a grid. So in Brock Commons, we can see a very repetitive rigid system. While in Tamedia, we can see that there is this moment of kind of um, interaction where two directions meet at a small area. Another example and what was noticed that when there are more irregular projects, it often happens that the core um, often made in concrete either due to fire or being on the exterior, but also with um, CLT is actually the area that um, is the irregular part. So that orthogonal segments are placed around it. So we actually, in terms of typology, can imagine that we still have this linear hallway in um, in a way around which um, spaces are kind of tied um, in both of these um, projects. Although on first glance they might seem um, when look at the massing like something might be different on the inside. Similar thing happens in this project as well where concrete was used to achieve a variation in um, the footprint of the balconies. So you can kind of see these angled columns um, as well as irregular form. Of course, uh, being on the exterior also played um, a part in this. When we look into more all timber projects, you can see that it very rarely happens that there's an irregular form and it's mostly when there's um, a low rise and a mix of use. So more special projects. And what happens is that there's a mix of systems as well. So we can see here a very clear post and beam structure with some um, panels as well. And then when we zoom into projects that might seem to be irregular and made in timber, and we kind of start to take it all apart, we realize that there is heavy use of steel uh, for irregular parts, not just in connections, which of course we know play a really big role in timber construction, but also um, in design. So there's entire slab areas made out of steel. So you can kind of begin to see this in um, this right-hand image in the project of Triodos Bank in Netherlands. And then when you look at the plan, we can really see that the timber parts are quite um, ordered um, and repetitive so that the irregularity itself is not actually coming from the usage of timber itself. In addition, these um, steel areas also are kind of framing all of the openings um, happening in the timber floor plates. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse going around the staircase openings. When we look at single story timber construction, we can see that things still are quite different. There's a wider range of spans, um, forms, multi-directionality, um, less of um, the existing grid and more experimentation. So if we take this as an inspiration, as well as what actually is happening in multi-story uh, typologies without thinking about timber, but more on design. And when we compare it to what concrete can do or what steel can do, we can see that um, there's a lot of um, play that can happen and that um, there is more room for design and design space to grow in timber multi-story construction. So we can see, for example, the project of house with one wall, where the supports are in different locations, their shifts, the vertically the spaces change, um, or 111 Lincoln Road, there is orientation change um, in terms of supports, different heights of floor plans, um, of course, more curvature in concrete in some of the Heatherwick work um, and angles. 
and also kind of um, looking at that there is a greater variety of single space, double height spaces and spatial situations in concrete that is most likely just linked to its multi-directional um, spanning capacities, but also to all of the technical development it had to grow over the um, last centuries rather than timber that's relatively new. So when you kind of think about how could um, multi-story timber construction evolve, we can think about that right now, most of the buildings are devised based on a grid. So the design starts on a grid or knowing your raster or your module and kind of growing your massing from there, as well as its um, interior um, division and spatial um, situations. On the other hand, what um, is being worked on in cluster, and I hope some of my other coworkers will present it at an event um, here, is um, an idea of a timber system that does not really need to um, adapt, need to follow a grid, but can adapt to your uh, design incentive so that there's more freedom and flexibility in the design, but also in terms of um, the distribution of vertical elements so that, that the system itself has the minimum amount of supports while achieving maximum amount of freedom and kind of that it is not what comes in the beginning, but kind of uh, comes from and you can build your design idea. And the benefit would be, of course, that there's a lot of sites and architecture in a way is different from a lot of these other industries where there's more specific sites, more specific um, situations in cities uh, where new or different timber construction could then be more responsive to, such as um, building on irregular sites, building on top of buildings that have then um, spans of concrete to adapt to, uh, or not having to follow an existing structure below, having an environmental response, atriums, um, framing views, and so on, all could be taken much more into consideration. So this is, of course, all coming from the idea of um, digital technologies and this kind of feedback of design and construction and digital fabrication working together. Um, so this is kind of a transition from a standardized regular grid spaces to more network and heterogeneous spaces that would expand the design space in multi-story timber architecture. So as part of kind of my research, and this is kind of just a, a short glimpse is identifying what spatial situations um, we could benefit from so that developing such a system makes sense and that we're not reproducing actually what is currently possible with the current construction methods. And that's it from me. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, Hannah and Alia again. And um, maybe now we can come to the uh, question. Are there any questions now directly? We get some hand clapping. If not, I may start uh, with uh, one question. Maybe I start with um, Hannah, if it's okay. Um, so, I mean, I find it very interesting now the, the last slices you showed and the direction that uh, the research goes in this, um, yeah, that we are get, uh, become more and more um, flexible also for, for timber slabs, for example. And um, is there an idea? Um, I mean, at the moment, um, uh, the concrete and, and other, uh, other materials ahead of timber in this uh, case, what you showed also, but um, yeah, is there a guess, maybe also could be from you or from, from the audience, is there a guess how far we are away um, to reach the flexibility which we have now for concrete uh, to reach it also for, for timber slabs? So I don't know, or is it maybe uh, we will never come there? So <laughs> what, what, what's your guess? Only a guess, Must, mustn't be precise. 
<clears throat> Do you want a, a time time frame or more of a? I, um, maybe it could be both. It could be a time frame, or it could be um, if if it's if it's um, in general, if it's um, not possible, if it's uh, yeah, or it, will it be possible one day? I guess we all hope that it would be, but but of course, I also think just on a personal level that since timber and concrete are inherently totally different material building in exactly the same way should not be possible. And maybe we should not achieve to it exactly, but just enabling a greater variation in timber, maybe even as a first step, achieving um, a greater variety if we build with post and slab rather than post and beam, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. example, in timber. Because if we think about it, if we think about the needs of housing, but also that we do not want to tear down um, houses that we build. Um, if we look at what's being built, it's either panel construction, which of course means tearing down load bearing walls. Uh, if it's not thought of in advance of, is it enough flexible? Or it's, um, post and beam and tin timber, because that's the only way to achieve. Um, long spans right now, but it's also a question of how big spans do we really need? Mm -hmm. But if, if we manage to kind of. Um, come more on a flat slab level and have more variety um, in terms of placing our divisions or moving them, I think that would be a big step uh, forward for timber construction. Just because when we look at the range of buildings that we have, the spans are quite small. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's still the regulatory things we consider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so far. And uh, are there any other questions regarding to um, the topics to Anna or Alia? Yes, I have a question okay. uh, to Alia. Uh, yes, uh, concerning this uh, architecture from the 70s. Mm -hmm. I saw in the presentation. Uh, there was one very important topic. Uh, it was flexibility, variability. Yes, uh, yeah. the architects say so. It's very important that the buildings are flexible, variability, and things like that. So now the buildings are they built? Uh, they were built in the seventies. Uh, so they, we know they are in use, or they were in use. And do we know something about uh, in the reality? Was there really a flexible use of the buildings were they adapted somewhere or was it possible really to use it change flexible and are there any is there any research about that yeah because uh, for me this this topic flexible everything has to be flexible but i i'm uh, just i'm asking me myself do we really flexible use yeah that uh, is very important question and very uh important uh yeah topic thank you so much so as i said that uh, in the 70s there was beginning of the post occupancy analysis and as it happens to be there was actually post occupancy analysis of the buildings of flexible and um elementa it's 440 pages report five or wait i think yeah five years later, the people moved in and questions about how do you use your space? Did you do any smaller interior renovations or changes? Did you do the bigger changes? Uh, how do you estimate? How do you feel yourself there? It's a report uh, of all of the different um, places as well, because all of these competitions that were done in different part of the of Germany. So you can also see difference between, for example, Bavaria or Nordrhein-Westfalen, um, but mostly it's West Germany. And um, as I already said, even in our precedents or even in this post occupancy analysis, you see that mostly the opportunity of flexibility was not being used. So the there was opportunity of moving the interior walls or doing some changes, 
but it was not used by the occupants, by the users. So what we looked at the RPT in the very beginning of our research, we looked at the notions or uh, understanding of flexibility and adaptability in the very beginning. Should flexibility be generic, being just a generic floor plan that you can do whatever you want? Or should it be flexibility or adaptability in the way that Hannah presented just now of the LCRL or the aim of cluster to do the building system that would be not generic cluster, but creating some adaptable spaces, uh, shifting the columns and creating some nonlinear. Uh, very interesting question. If you want, I can send you a link. There is this document that I found. Uh, it's from the EFA. Um, and yeah, as I said, there were consultants. Uh, among the consultants, there were also architects of Danish who actually went to the occupants and did this whole uh, evaluation. How do they actually find this flexibly one and clean this? Um, but out of my own pers personal perspective, I would say that the experiment stayed experiment because we uh, uh, mostly still live in predefined uh, generic roster layout buildings. I grew up in Russia where panel housing and huge blocks are norm. Uh, and the option of creating your own environment or surrounding is still not very mm. yeah, fair. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe I have something like a note. <laughs> um, uh, yesterday I was remembering um, of a lecture I once um, heard in, when I studied <laughs> from Rudolf Horn. He was a, a furniture designer and architect uh, in the GDR in uh, Eastern Germany. And um, he designed um, furniture. They um, were from the bottom to the up to the ceiling. And his idea was um, that you can create your own uh, ground plan in your apartment with, with this furniture. <laughs> um, because um, every time your life situation changes, you can change your like the number of your rooms you need. Um, and therefore he designed this uh, furniture. And I was wondering, um, yeah, if you considered something like that. <laughs> And um, what I was um, actually going to say is um, that I think this uh, furniture program wasn't that um, successful um, because um, uh, they had some um, uh, Musterwohnungen. Um, uh, some uh, model yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and some people um, used this furniture, but it wasn't that popular in the GDR, unfortunately. Or well, I don't know. I think this idea is um, quite simple and um, somehow genius, but it wasn't that successful. <laughs> yeah, that is so the same that Priota was talking about in the adaptable uh, architecture symposium that. In a way, when we are doing everything very adaptable and generic to everybody the same, that everybody is building with the same blocks. And how can you actually, like, where is you? Where is, like, your personal identity in these buildings where there's a huge mass housing of 50,000 people living in there and everybody has the same layout, everybody has the same building blocks for their kitchen or for this uh, furniture. Uh, it is, yeah, I feel that it's very in trend of that idea of socialism back then in the DR where everybody has this standardized kitchen unit, standardized, whatever, I don't know, lifestyle. Uh, but that is actually what the architects back then in the 70s were, uh, or even these radical movements they were warning you about. They were saying, hey, we're standardizing everything, we're uh, doing everything economically um, 
profitable and quick and fast and at the end we're actually losing the, the identity of the space because then you can put this panel block where it's standing in Moscow or it's standing in Rio de Janeiro and it's it's the same. Sorry. <laughs> for my rent. Yeah. 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 So what, what I wanted to say as well, what we find what we uh this is the, actually the book, Architekturwettbewerbe, is if somebody wants to read more about the each uh submission. So the competitions that I was talking about, only one submission out of all of them thought about flexibility in vertical dimension. So most of them are looking at the flexibility in a way of, hey, I have here a side plan, I have here a normal plan, and we can just expand like more having the spaces of the earth around us. But it's very rare and only one in the last in Integra were thinking about what it is if flexibility would be remove a ceiling of or remove the slab of one space and it will be a double space. Or <laughs> that's it. I just feel that we need that more creative approach or adaptable approach to the building system. This is why uh, Hannah's contribution to in in which way our Systems are still that restrictive and still so generic is actually very valuable. Okay, thank you, Alia. Are there any more questions? Maybe also from the audience. Uh, um, yeah. Maybe everyone can now open uh, their cameras and maybe this is like. better for our <laughs> discussion. So if you want to, please feel free. <laughs> And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Maybe I have one um, uh, one more question for for Alia. Um, you had, I think, on slide eleven there was this um, cross where you mm -hmm. have the vertical. You had uh, innovation and tradition. Yeah. And and my question is um, if it's um, if it's if it's right to. Uh, to put uh, the tradition always on the opposite of the innovation, because um, um, in the beginning I showed this example from structure um, where they, um, based on this um, traditional uh, carpentry connection, they transferred somehow in, in the future, I would say, or they, they, they made something new out of it. And uh, I think um, there are different phases from, from uh, tradition. And um, of course, if we see if we look on tradition as um, just keeping it like this and never change a running system, then uh, it would fit. But uh, if if um, tradition also have, I think uh, the, the the impact for uh, giving uh, new ideas for for the future. So maybe yeah, that's not a real question, but <laughs> that's something to to remark on. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, if you want, I can share the slide again and to yeah. explain more about it. Uh, this was our joint diagram that we built uh, together in RP10 uh, and within the Institute of Architectural History, we were looking at the tradition mm -hmm. and novelty of uh, building systems. So that means all the, the building tools. So uh, brick and mortar will be tradition. And I don't know, prefabrication would be probably innovation there. But it also, it only works this diagram, not only looking at one axis of tradition to innovation, but also looking at standardization and individualization. And these four corners that you see, these is the aspects which we're looking at. Are the building system rigid or not? Cost efficient, are they monotonous? Are uh, they use using existing codes and procedures, or there's unprecedented codes and building codes and procedures. Are they more demonstrative in a way that they are experimental user oriented? Uh, prefabricated system for me is innovation because before the 60s, there were generally not that, it's not a brick and mortar. <laughs> it's not something very hands on. Uh, platform based solutions that started their control over the budget and still though, remitted length of 
a limited range of options for the upper left corner. So yeah, I understand your your command, and we talked about it a lot. Whether innovation is actually the right word to use it, but it was more in a way of traditional built-in tools and novel built-in tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Then, any other question? If not, I would hand over to Julia for the last round now. And uh, thanks again for the participants, but um, we are not done now, but soon. <laughs> so Julia, you had the word. Yeah, we prepared something like a general questions first for our speakers and then of course um, for our audience. Um, we were wondering <laughs> um, um, what will be the relationship between social housing and lighthouse projects in the future? Um, will they approach somehow? <laughs> um, because um, through all of these new developments in construction, like robotics and so on, um, or will it still be a question of standardization and individualization in the future? Um, we would like to ask all of our three speakers um, to give an, um, yeah, a comment <laughs> on, our, uh, on our question and afterwards, um, yeah, the audience. Um, Alia, do we, uh, Alia, you are still yeah. muted. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask, maybe you can ask this question in German, because I don't think I understood it in English. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, also, wir wollten um, so ein bisschen so eine allgemeine Frage stellen, über die man diskutieren kann, eine offene Frage, um, und die euch, uh, euch drei Rednerinnen am Anfang gerne fragen und danach das gerne auch fürs Publikum öffnen. Um, und zwar haben wir uns gefragt, wie in Zukunft, ähm, in welchem Verhältnis in Zukunft ähm, sozialer Wohnungsbau und Leuchtturmprojekte stehen. Also so. werden die sich annähern? Kann man sagen, dass ähm, sozialer Wohnungsbau in Zukunft nicht so rechteckig aussehen wird, sondern auch freiere Formen mhm. bekommen wird? Ähm, wird es da durch die neuen Möglichkeiten, neue Technologien überhaupt noch diese Unterscheidung wie Leute sozusagen geben können oder ähm, könnten die sich sogar annähern in der Zukunft? Uh, I would start then. <laughs> I'm still unmuted. Uh, so I, I feel my personal impression. If you look at Hannah's part of the presentation of the Mohold building, this is a student house in the uh, Brock house building, it's also student house. And so I think that's something that more social housing will maybe be a platform for experimentation and hopefully that will be the starting point of creating more interest in more lighthouse projects that will create a new building culture that they will inspire of uh inspire new typologies that we use up until now uh that is my my hope at least, but also my hope is that uh, looking back 50 years from now, that also society and politics will be at par with the developments in the building culture and will actually accept and go on with it and invest the money and state will fund. Uh, something that we talked about Yesterday in our RP10 meeting, that the new uh, update about uh, state uh, is not funding the KfW project anymore, uh, KfW. Um, so, would there be some state funded initiatives which will help, help us in a timber multi stories to create social housing that will be a, a lighthouse? or everything that comes. We need more of that. Okay. 
Thank Let's you. tell this uh, to the Ministry of Rural Areas <laughs> at the next meeting moment. <laughs> yeah, he's he's gone. He was he was there, but now he's gone. He yeah. knew. <laughs> so, um, yeah, then maybe maybe Hannah, do you want to come in? Yeah, I think I I really in a way um like how Alia expressed um room for experimentation. I I think currently maybe. Timber developments also really influenced by research and development. Um, and I hope that this kind of will manifest not only in terms of technical um, in enhancements for timber construction, but also thinking about what the new ways and spaces of living are. So from more design perspective, so maybe just linking more um, te uh, technical development um, with more designers and educating more designers about potentials would be also a way to go. And I hope that that would kind of, I, I don't know, when I, whenever I think about um, projects that were different, I think a lot of them were also, and the conception was as research or in academia, uh, as like a protected bubble where ideas emerge. So maybe that's something that, um, really starts happening more and more as research and development gets more um, appreciated in practice. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, yeah, Uber Nopper, you want to join? No pardon. I just was interrupted. Uh, ich war gerade unterbrochen. Uh, um, okay. Um, Julia, willst du die, mal? Soll ich die Frage noch mal wiederholen? Ja, bitte. Genau. Um, also das war eher so eine offene Frage, so eine Einschätzung. Uh, wollten wir gerne von Ihnen. Um, wie, wie wird das in Zukunft das Verhältnis zwischen uh, sozialem Wohnungsbau und Leuchtturmprojekten sein? Also glauben Sie, die könnten sich annähern? in Zukunft ähm, durch die neuen Entwicklungen im Bauwesen, dass man auch im sozialen Wohnungsbau zum Beispiel viel freier wird, viel freiere Formen hat, ähm, dass da einfach sozusagen nicht mehr so diese großen Unterschiede sind zwischen ganz platt gesagt jetzt mal der rechte Winkel und der Kasten auf der einen Seite und die freie Form auf der anderen. Also zunächst mal ist es so, dass wir ganz, ganz viele Vorschriften haben für den sozial geförderten Wohnungsbau. Also die muss, da ist genau festgeschrieben, wie die Wohnung eben äh, auszusehen hat oder nicht auszusehen, aber wie viele Quadratmeter das haben darf, wie groß die Abstellfläche sein muss, wie groß irgendwelche Nebenflächen sein dürfen. Also ich kenne das nicht alles auswendig, aber da gibt es ganz, ganz viele ähm, Regulare. Die Wohnungen dürfen nicht zu klein sein, die dürfen aber auch nicht zu groß sein. Und ähm, insofern und auf der anderen Seite gibt es aber auch gewisse Standards und die Baustandards werden immer höher, auch gerade was so Thema Sicherheit anbelangt, was das Thema Brandschutz ist ja angesprochen worden, anbelangt, was das Thema Außenraumgestaltung anbelangt. Also ähm, das macht eben das Bauen einfach teuer. Und es ist ja auch bekannt, dass eben durch ganz, ganz viele Vorschriften das Bauen einfach ähm, teurer wird. Und das ist ein ziemlicher Spagat. Und im Wohnungsbau ist es so, die Mieten sind dann vorgegeben und ein Investor, der kann sich aus der Miete ausrechnen, wie viel das Projekt kosten darf. Und damit ist in diesem Bereich schon also da ein richtiger Spagat da. Also dieses ganz freie Entwerfen und Leuchtturmprojekte, das ist so schon, also das sehe ich schon, also weiß ich jetzt nicht, ob das so zusammenkommen wird. In diesem Fall jetzt zum Beispiel bei unserem Projekt, ist es halt so, dass wir sehr, sehr viele relativ kleine Wohnungen haben, viele. Ja, und äh, damit ist natürlich die Miete pro Quadratmeter etwas höher. Ja, es ist trotzdem vielleicht noch eine günstige Wohnung in der Summe im absoluten Wert. Ja, aber äh, das hat es eben auch ermöglicht, da ähm, etwas, äh, ja, sowas zu realisieren. Ja, und dann gab es auch noch Zuschüsse und, und so weiter, Förderungen. Also ich kenne jetzt die ganze gesamte Finanzierungsstruktur, kenne ich nicht. Also das hat auf jeden Fall dieses Projekt in dieser Form ermöglicht. Aber in der Breite ist es schon schwierig. Und natürlich haben unsere Bauherren haben einfach dieses Problem. Ich sage jetzt einmal Stichwort KfW 55 ist ja jetzt gestoppt. Gut, 
irgendwo verständlich. Klar, das ist inzwischen ein Baustandard, aber das war ein Zuschuss, mit dem hat man kalkuliert. Äh, und der ist jetzt weg. Jetzt muss man natürlich auf KfW 40 oder äh, gehen. Der ist aber wieder teurer. Ja, also wie gesagt, also unsere, unsere Projekte, das, was wir machen, das ist immer irgendwo an der Kante. Ja, also in der Wirtschaftlichkeit, ja, weil wir auch, und dann haben wir natürlich noch ein ökologisches Produkt, ja, und das ist halt teurer wie ein Wärmedämmverbundsystem. Und ein Holzfenster ist halt auch teurer als ein Kunststofffenster und ein Linoleum teurer als ein PVC und, 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 ja. Und also diesen Spagat, das ist eigentlich so das, was wir tagtäglich erleben und auch wirklich kämpfen müssen, um Projekte, aber wir haben auch viele Kunden, die wirklich das schätzen und auch versuchen und das auch möchten, auch was ändern möchten. Also und äh, deswegen sind wir auch da durchaus auch erfolgreich. Aber erst im Wohnungsbau, im klassischen Wohnungsbau, wo sie wirklich diese Miete haben und aus der Miete sich dann den Ertrag rechnen und dann die Investition dagegen setzen müssen, ja, da können sie, da, dem sind dann irgendwo Grenzen gesetzt, irgendwo, ne? also dem Investitionsbudget. Das war jetzt schon eine ganze Menge. Okay. Aber so die, die, alltägliche, äh, die alltägliche Herausforderung ja, zwischen ja. schön bauen oder auch ökologisch bauen und aber auch ganz klar, äh, sagen wir, diesen, diesem, ja, unterworfen zu sein. Aber auf, ich finde es auf der anderen Seite auch spannend, ja, weil ich denke, auch gerade in diesen Bereichen soll ja auch was Ansprechendes und auch was Ökologisches auch realisiert werden können. Das ist die Herausforderung. Okay, danke schön. Jetzt haben wir eine Wortmeldung aus dem Publikum. Ähm, Benny Eisele. Ja, danke schön. Ähm, ich denke, an der Stelle ist es eben die Frage, wie man Leuchtturmprojekt definiert. Also ein Leuchtturmprojekt kann ein Projekt sein, das durch eine herausragende architektonische Gestaltung und Freiform sich definiert. Aber für mich wäre jetzt ein Leuchtturmprojekt eher ein Projekt, das, ich sage mal, auf allen Ebenen punktet. Und da gehört eben auch die Kosteneffizienz dazu, da gehört die Materialeffizienz dazu und da gehört auch die Energieeffizienz dazu. Und dementsprechend, wenn man das eben schafft, alle Punkte ähm, souverän zu lösen, sprich ein Gebäude, das funktional ist, das mit sehr wenig Materialeinsatz zurechtkommt, das vielleicht demontierbar ist, das man wiederverwerten kann dann, ähm, und das gleichzeitig auch noch günstig ist, dann wäre das für mich ein, ein Leuchtturmprojekt. Und dann spricht da auch nichts dagegen, dass man das eben im sozialen Wohnungsbau einsetzt, weil es eben auch Kosteneffizienz neben allen anderen Faktoren ist. Das heißt, das wäre so eine Art äh, Kommunikationsaufgabe, ähm, auch das, was nicht offensichtlich äh, ins Auge springt durch eine besondere Form, als was Besonderes eben darzustellen oder sagen wir mal, ähm, das, was nicht offensichtlich auf dem Foto rüberkommt, kommunikativ zu vermitteln. Richtig, genau. Das sind eben, natürlich sieht man die Gestaltung als erstes, aber viele andere Bereiche, in denen eben so ein Gebäude auch punkten kann, sieht man nicht als erstes und absolut richtig, das wäre dann eben Aufgabe der Kommunikation, eben die Punkte auch darzustellen. Mhm. Okay, danke. Dann noch weitere Beiträge? Aus dem Publikum. Wir sind ja auch schon wieder weit fortgeschritten. Von daher ähm, danke nochmal an alle Teilenden, an, an die Vortragenden. Und ja, uh, yeah, then we will come to the last final round. Ja, um, yeah, that would be just um, before we go home a question. Maybe every Uh, participant or for every uh, presenter can ask um, the other person what would uh, he like to take from him. So, Alia, you can decide, for example, if you want to um, dir eine Scheibe abschneiden von Hanna or Herr Nopper. And if you do that, um, what would you take? What did, would you take home now from this day? To, to improve or, or uh, take with you and then you can hand over to Anna and Anoka. But you mean that not literally cutting off stuff of other people? <laughs> no, I don't understand. Scheibe abschneiden, not literally cutting. Oh, we understand you, I think. 
Just what you take away from uh, from yeah. the other speakers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Some German expressions I still need to learn. Um. Yeah, Hannover. I think I would take away home the idea of that active house or building with three zeros is actually a real opportunity, not even opportunity, it's reality. Mm -hmm. And we're so much past the visions for the future, as uh, somebody said, if we want to achieve our goals and by 2050, we need to start acting now. So start building now uh, and yeah, this is what my impression of making the passive house or active house is a reality. Thank you. Ich bin immer wieder fasziniert, wenn ich sehe, I'm always fascinated if I see what, what, um, yes, but in other um, parts of the world or in Scandinavian countries or even in Germany, wherever, um, the possibilities uh, that, um, yes, Hannah uh, showed us, yes, uh, this interesting architecture. I think it's fa fascinating, yes, what is possible and also the creativity of human, um, yes. This is not, not everything is everywhere possible, yes, uh, but it's, I think it's important that, that we can see what is possible. And so uh, this was uh, very interesting for me. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Um, well, first, thank you guys for organizing this. I think altogether it was really nice to hear the uh, three lectures and also just to uh, see and kind of go through the steps of um, the design and considerations that you presented today um, for the Steve House was really interesting. I think what um, kind of maybe in discussion came out was how historically, Although technologies have gone further, we've changed our materials, but this issue of flexibility and unanswered questions on how to improve the way we lived are still unanswered. So I'm kind of interested in how future shaping or thoughts about this evolve. Because I think whenever we're talking about housing or modular construction, this always kind of seems to be a big um, topic. So. I think it was very interesting to see historical overview and also thoughts from um, someone and how they predicted um, 2020. I think that's, I don't know, just crazy to see sometimes. <laughs> okay, yeah, then thank you all for coming and um, joining and um, being with us and I think for me it was uh, interesting too, and um, but we don't want to, uh, yeah, let it run too too long. So so I think it's we are right on time. I um, was wondering uh, if if we um, match this today, but um, yeah, thanks again for joining and um, having you here, and have a good evening, and um, see you next time. Yeah, goodbye. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. bye bye. Danke auch für die Vorträge bye. und ähm, wir sind auch gerne offen für Feedback, also genau. im Nachhinein und immer wir, gerne. Wir auch nochmal auf den einen oder anderen zurück hier. Na, ja. Ansonsten bis zum nächsten Mal. Dankeschön ja. und tschüss. Danke. Danke. Schön. Vielen Dank. Tschüss. Schönes Wochenende. Bye. bye.